only disclosure is that I have been, uh, I have served on the uh, advisory board for uh, Bristol Myers Squibb. What I want to talk about today in, in, uh, in about an hour is a very, very brief history of obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, how it's diagnosed, its physiology, uh, how it was treated prior to April of 2022. Um, both pharmacologically and surgically, and then uh, the new era of cardiac myosin inhibition, which has made this, I think, particularly exciting, and then uh, some management of concomitant medical conditions that one frequently uh, encounters uh, with HCM, and I'll also share some of my experience and some of the things that I've done, which are perhaps slightly uh, uh, off-label, but I think will stimulate some discussion. Um, this is a condition that was first called idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis, and the original paper that described this, which is now uh, over six decades old, was uh, first lead author was this fellow here. This is a young Eugene Broadwald. Dr. Broadwald is now 94 years old and still very, very uh, active at Harvard. And uh, this is the first paper that described what turned what would eventually be called uh, obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The surgeon uh, who is the co-author on this paper is Dr. Andrew Morrow, and Dr. Morrow uh, pioneered the first myomectomy uh, procedures that were done to treat obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a pathologic specimen that actually uh, shows a very, very large left atrium, a very, very thick uh, ventricle and septum. And you can see that there is uh, uh, room here for uh, room here for nothing, uh, very little space here. And, and uh, this is what a pathologic heart of obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, in one of the great ironies of medical history, this pathologic specimen is Dr. Morrow's heart. Dr. Morrow, who pioneered the surgery, was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy by Dr. Braunwald with, of all things, a stethoscope. Don't forget there was no echo back then. Um, and Dr. Morrow uh, eventually succumbed to complications from obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a uh, sarcom sarcomeric mutation. Uh, there are many genes that we have identified and probably a lot which we have not identified as well. It is usually uh, an autosomal dominant uh, transmission with variable penetrance. And being that I am an echo person, I can't help but show some echo images. So this is the classic M mode of uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. So you can see the anterior mitral leaflet here coming up and having contact with the septum. Uh, during uh, systole. For those of you who are really echo nerds like myself, there's also a B bump here demonstrating an elevated left ventricular and diastolic pressure. And this is the classic uh, splay of color that you get. Now, not everybody with systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve has mitral regurgitation. Most patients do, but not all. Um, and the vector of the mitral regurgitation can be anywhere. It's thought that it's usually posterolateral uh, in its uh, in its direction, um, but there can be a lot of variability about that, especially if there are concomitant mitral valve pathologies uh, as well. Um, when one sees this splay of turbulence going into the uh, left atrium and the aorta at the same time, whether you can see the 2D image well or not, only obstructive HCM looks like this. And this is what it looks like in an apical five chamber view where you can see the mitral septal contact as well. And again, for those of you who are like echo subtlety, there is a little systolic fluttering of the aortic valve, which you can notice here when the aortic valve opens, it actually flutters a little bit. And that's because as systole ensues, the amount of flow that goes through the ventricle starts to diminish because of the obstruction. And so the valve starts to partially uh, close. And this is the dagger shape. This is a late peaking jet. Um, of uh, in systole through the left ventricular outflow tract uh, of a, uh, obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a very, very severe gradient here. This gradient here is, is easily uh, over 150 millimeters of mercury. Um, and it comes with a concomitant mitral regurgitation jet where the uh, velocity can reach eight meters per second, demonstrating a ridiculously high pressure at, at the end of systole in the left ventricle in patients who have severe uh, LVOT obstruction, but I'm not going to turn this in into an echo talk, although we can do that another time if you would like. Um, there are many reasons why obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the uh, community is misdiagnosed. That's also a separate conversation, uh, but I will say that um, one of the reasons is that uh, one has to pay attention to the morphology or the curvature of what continuous wave Doppler looks like in HCM. It's a late peaking jet, as opposed to the more common mid peaking jet that you see with valvular 
aortic stenosis, and the less common but identical appearing on an echo, uh, subaortic membranes. Subaortic membranes in valvular aortic stenosis are fixed obstructions which peak in mid-systole as opposed to HCM, which peaks in late systole as well. Um, one other thing I do want to mention um, is that for many years, people would teach in uh, medical school that systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve causing dynamic alveolar T obstruction happened because of what they call the Venturi effect, where a high velocity jet would suck the mitral valve into the alveolar T. That's actually not true. Uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve happens because the valve is pushed into the LVRT. And what you need for that to happen is you need to have two things. You have to have enough septal hypertrophy and you have to have enough slack in the anterior mitral leaflet so that the vortex of flow changes such that the flow comes in from the posterior lateral approach and literally pushes both the anterior and posterior leaflets into the LVRT. So SAM actually starts in pre-systole with atrial ejection. And that was actually shown by Dr. Sherrod, who at the time was at St. Luke's and is currently at uh, New York University Medical Center running the HCM program there. But this paper now is over uh, 20 years old um, and still very, very nicely demonstrates uh, the reason that patients have systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. In fact, in their paper, when SAM started, the LBOT velocity wasn't even one meter per second, which is on, before the onset of ventricular ejection. Okay, so how was this treated traditionally? Well, all the things that sort of made physiologic sense. None of the treatments that we had for this condition until very recently were treatments that were tried and true and proven by, 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 uh, by studies. It was all, this makes physiologic sense, so why don't we do it? Um, but all of the agents that we used to treat this, this condition pharmacologically were repurposed from other conditions. So what makes systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve worse? Well, making the ventricle smaller and making the ventricle squeeze harder. What makes the ventricle squeeze harder? Either afterload reduction or anything that increases um, inotropy. So what would you do? You would wanna keep the patient's LV big. So you wanna keep them volume replete and avoid diuretics. When you keep the ventricle slow with typically beta blockers and sometimes uh, non-dihydroperidine calcium channel blockers such as diptyosum or verapamil, what would you do? Well, you would decrease inotropy, but you would also make the heart rate slower and in doing so increase diastolic filling time and make the left ventricle bigger. And these are things that would to a degree relatively modestly, I would say, mitigate systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Um, Norpace, which is disopyramide, is a class 1A antiarrhythmic, which uh, can safely be given as an outpatient, provided uh, that your baseline QT interval is normal and that you're not on any concomitant QT prolonging uh, drugs, and has very uh, reasonably good, anyway, negative inotropic effects. However, it is a TID drug, and... Um, in addition to that, it has a number of anticholinergic effects, uh, such as constipation, dry mouth, urinary retention. Uh, when I've given disopyramide in my practice, I have sometimes had to add mestinon just to treat the side effects of the disopyramide. It's probably the only time in my practice where I've had to give one drug to treat the side effects of the other drug. Calcium channel blockers, uh, which in, in my own personal opinion, have very modest effects at best. Similarly, can cause constipation, uh, edema, peripheral edema, which is usually dependent, worse at night, uh, fatigue and headache. And beta blockers, I think uh, we're all familiar with the common side effects um, that patients get um, with beta blockade. Remember, all of these agents were repurposed for the, for the treatment of obstructive, of obstructive HCM. None of them were specifically designed for it. And despite multiple com multiple combinations of these agents. And uh, in my practice, there was a period where I, I would have patients on all of these classes concomitantly. And despite that, they were still very, very uh, symptomatic. And when that happened, you would have to uh, consider procedures. Uh, the typical procedures that people use with myomectomy uh, and alcohol septal ablation. Uh, this is a slide taken from uh, this paper that was published uh, by the Mayo Clinic based on their experience uh, at, um, over the years. And you can see this is what the uh, heart would look like pre-op and post-op. And I'll actually show you what these look like in moving pictures. So this is a pre-op SAM, 
And you can see two things have happened. Number one, there is a septomyectomy, but number two, the anterior mitral leaflet has been shortened and plicated. Remember, in order to have SAM, you have to have slack on the anterior mitral leaflet. If you plicate it, make it stiffer, it's not going to get pushed into the uh, LVOT. And of course, decreasing the amount of hypertrophy here also changes the flow pattern so that you no longer have uh, mitral septal contact. Um, myomectomy was traditionally the, uh, I think, more tried and true uh, procedure compared to alcohol. And there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, um, myomectomy would give you immediate symptom relief. Um, it tends to work better. The re need for a repeat procedure after alcohol septal ablation is much uh, greater than it is um, after uh, a septal myomectomy. Um, when you're in the operating room, should you need to go there, you could also address other problems such as uh, left atrial appendage. So if a patient had a large left atrium and you were worried about atrial fibrillation in the future, you could take care of the appendage. And many patients with HCM would have vari uh, variations in the mitral anatomy that could be addressed at the same time if they needed to, uh, again, but that's beyond the scope of uh, this evening's um, lecture. Um, and there is some data from the Mayo Clinic uh, over 20 years ago that patients who have septal reduction therapy with surgery um, actually had a reduction in overall mortality. Okay, so in any case, um, I'll show you that over here. This is from, uh, what is this? This is um, Mayo Clinic in uh, 2005. And you can see here that patients who had a myomectomy actually had a survival that was similar to age-matched controls as opposed to patients who had obstructive HCM that were not operated on. And this is looking at uh, mortality over 10 years. Uh, one thing that I will mention to you that for all of the harping that we do on the LVOT gradient, and the LVOT gradient is a very, very important thing to talk about because that's really the correlate of how patients feel. But in terms of sudden death risk stratification, it's no longer uh, listed as a risk factor. And the reason for that is very simple. It's too much of a more moving target, right? Um, you can stand up and change it. You can put the patient on an antihypertensive and change it. They can become volume depleted and uh, it can it can change. There are too many things that can make the LVOT move around from one thing to another. So the gradient is actually not something that we think about when we talk about sudden death risk stratification. And the things that we talk about, again, this is from the most recent guidelines. The guidelines for uh, treatment of HCM in the United States were rewritten in November, 2020 after a nine year hiatus. Um, and I will say as, a, as an aside, I don't think that future iterations of those guidelines are gonna wait nearly that long. But um, the guideline, the things that we look at for uh, risk stratification for arrhythmias we have to do with unexplained syncope. And unexplained syncope, by the way, is an important one, right? Because this does not mean syncope when you're exerting yourself. Right? If a patient has obstructive HCM, it goes without saying, saying that when they, when they exert themselves sufficiently, they can obstruct the flow so much that they can actually become hypotensive and have syncope. And positional syncope or positional lightheadedness, some patients get lightheaded just by bending over if they want to tie their shoes. Okay, that's, that's not arrhythmic syncope. That doesn't buy you a defibrillator. That gets you treatment for your LVOT obstruction. So when we're talking about unexplained syncope, we're talking about patients who have uh, episodes when they are not exerting themselves. Um, an ejection fraction less than 50 is considered systolic dysfunction uh, in HCM. Apical aneurysms, which we see a lot of, especially in the non-obstructive uh, form, although I do have patients who have both obstructive uh, uh, HCM as well as apical aneurysms as well. So the presence of one doesn't necessarily uh, preclude the uh, presence of, of another. Uh, LGE is a 2B um, indication if you have more than 15% mass. And I will say that that should really be read by somebody who uh, has experience in training in cardiac uh, MRI, because if not, uh, I have personally experienced a lot of variability in the readings on these things. Um, family history uh, in first degree relatives obviously has to be taken into uh, consideration. And uh, massive LVH is something that's always talked about more than uh, three centimeters um, as a uh, independent risk factor for um, sudden death. Okay, uh, just a quick thing about how um, alcohol and myomectomy compare to each other. And again, alcohol septal ablation was traditionally thought of as something you could do if a patient wasn't a surgical candidate or didn't want 
open heart surgery. And although there is no sternotomy, and therefore there's a shorter hospital stay, which makes it less expensive, and there's a lower risk of an iatrogenic VSD, um, there is a risk in the meta-analyses of these two, two different forms of treatment that if you have alcohol septal ablation, you are much more likely to need a permanent pacemaker and fivefold risk of requiring a second procedure. And that's something that I've seen in my practice. I have many patients who have had alcohol septal ablations who still have very significant LVOT gradients uh, afterwards. And you can see here, um, my myomectomy does not cause an infarct, whereas uh, alcohol does cause a controlled artifact and uh, a controlled infarct, and therefore you do get a scar when you look at these patients on uh, cardiac MRI, as opposed with myomectomy, uh, you don't. Remember also that alcohol is blind. You don't know exactly what you're going to take off a priori. You don't know what the patient's coronary anatomy is going to be like um, when you get in there. And if the muscle is too thick, it's most likely to be ineffective. Okay, that's where we were. Um, and the paradigm for treating hypertrophic cardiomyopathy took a turn for the better uh, last year when uh, at the end of April, uh, the first cardiac myosin inhibitor got uh, approved by the FDA. This is its chemical structure, if any of you are uh, interested. Um, Mavicampton reduces the amount of, my of myosin that is available to interact with actin. Uh, and fortunately, the chemical structure of these uh, proteins in the heart is different slightly than it is in peripheral muscle, which allows us to target cardiac muscle specifically without dealing with uh, all the other muscles uh, in, in your body. Um, these two proteins interact not only in systole, but in diastole as well, and therefore likely have favorable lusotropic effects, They probably, which is to say that they make the heart relax better. And that is has been uh, the subject of phase two tri trials with uh, cardiac mice inhibition uh, that have already been published and phase three trials that are currently um, underway. What do you need to know about Mavicampton if you're using it? Um, these are its principal uh, metabolic pathways in the cytochromes of the liver. It has a half-life of about a week. There are some two C9 metabolizers that are slow, in which case it can take as long as uh, a little over three weeks for a half-life. Um, it does require vigilance um, in ejection fraction and LVOT gradient because the therapeutic index of these agents is not too much higher than one which is why you have to watch them very, very carefully. Mavicampton is contraindicated in, in pregnancy. It is my understanding that Afficampton is not, um, but that has not yet uh, been approved by the FDA. Um, there's some drug-drug interactions and some food-drug interactions that you need to know of. In my experience, these have not been uh, game changers. Um, most of my patients are are not so enamored with grapefruit juice that they can't do without it. Grapefruit juice is a 3A4 inhibitor, and so it can raise the levels of Mavicampton. Prolocepic and Nexium have three other agents in the same family that can be substituted that do not interact. Um, Paxlovid is actually uh, probably the most relevant drug interaction because it's a powerful 2C19 inhibitor. Um, and during the pandemic, um, I did have to give one of my patients uh, antibodies because I did not want to give her Paxlovid. Okay, so a, a couple of words about the trials that have been published, the phase three trials that have been published about Mavicampton. Uh, the trial that got it its approval was Explorer HCM, which was in the Lancet 2020. Um, there were sub-studies, which I'll mention just because they talk about some of the very, very favorable morpho morphologic effects that have occurred on the heart uh, when these agents have been given. Um, there was an ECHO sub-study that was published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology um, and an MRI uh, sub-study that was published in circulation all around um, the following year. This is August 2020, and these are in 2021. So without going into uh, each trial in enormous detail, because that would frankly take too long, what you can see here is, again, a trial of approximately 250-something patients and New York Heart Association classes over here. And you can see that the patients who got Mavicampton, you have fewer and fewer patients in higher classes of heart failure and more and more classes of New York Heart Association. One coming in here and New York two. Remember, to be in this trial, you could not be class one to start. You had to be class two or class three. So there were no class ones initially, but as the trial goes on, you get more and more class ones. 
and you get fewer and fewer class threes as opposed to placebo, where there's not too much of a change at, at all. If you look at the number of patients in, that got a post-exercise LVOC gradient all the way down to below 30 millimeters of mercury, uh, it was 57 compared to 7%, which is highly statistically uh, significant with a relative uh, difference of uh, 49 here. Um, and you can see here, what I did here is just, this is also from Explorer. You'll notice that the ejection fractions really don't change. And remember, yes, these agents do decrease systolic function, but you also get afterload reduction, right? Because ejection fraction is an afterload dependent phenomena. And when you get rid of SAM, you're decreasing the afterload. So overall, EF was a bust, not statistically different. However, if you look at, and again, in all of these graphs, the red is placebo and the blue are patients that were treated with Mavicantin. If you see here the resting LVOT gradient, which these, these separate very, very uh, rapidly, the Valsalva LVOT gradient, the post-exercise LVOT gradient, markers of myocardial wall stress, and most of these trials use both and terminal BNP, and high sensitivity cardiac troponin I, all of these separate early and stay separated. This is from the ECHO substudy of Explorer HCM, looking specifically at diastolic parameters here. So you can see here after 30 weeks of Mavicampton, it's not surprising that the resting LVOT gradient went from 136 to six or with Valsalva from 144 to 17. And this is something that any of us who have been using this drug regularly see routinely. I will say as an aside that when the sonographers see these patients, they, they look astonished and like, where did it go? But it, it really does work. Um, and if you look at these parameters that we use uh, as markers of diastolic function, crude that they may be, specifically the lateral and septal tissue Doppler velocities at the mitral annulus, you can see that these go up. This is from the MRI substudy. And you can see that on the left, you have uh, myocardium at baseline, two patients at baseline. This is a patient who was going to get Mavicampton and placebo over here. Um, this doesn't seem to be playing as fast as I'd like it to be. Um, and you can see here, um, after Mavicampton 30 weeks, the left atrium is smaller. The end diastolic volume of the left ventricle is bigger. So these are all things that are very, very uh, favorable. And you can imagine that if you have a smaller left atrial volume, it's you would, you would imagine that over time, you might avoid certain complications like atrial fibrillation. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Okay. Um, Valor HCM was published in July of 2022. So about two years later, this was a higher uh, risk patient population. In, a, in Explorer, I should mention, patients should, could have been on beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. In Valor, they could have been on, on those agents, but there were some patients in Valor that were also taking disopyramide as well. And these were patients that had enough of a gradient uh, that they could qualify for a surgical procedure, which is now called septal reduction therapy, meaning either surgery or alcohol, if they needed to. And this was a total of 112 patients that were initially uh, studied for 16 weeks, and then the placebo group crossed over. Uh, Valor announced its most recent data, which I think extends it up to about 56 weeks at uh, European Society of Cardiology this past um, August in Amsterdam. So anyway, here are out outcomes that are very, very similar to what you would have seen in Explorer. If you look at the number of patients who needed, um, who were eligible to go for uh, uh, septal reduction therapy, dramatic difference between placebo and Mavicampton. Um, and if you look at, here, at all of these other parameters, and I'm gonna show you all of these on graphs as well. So, um, but what are the things we're looking at? We're looking at LVOT gradients, changes in New York Heart Association class, Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaires, and of course, these two markers, again, of myocardial wall stress. Look at the p-values, and I'll show you what these look like on graphs. So after the initial 16 weeks, only about 18% of patients on Mavicampton uh, compared to 77% of patients on placebo still had LVOT gradients that would have qualified them for septal reduction therapy. In addition, if you look at the number of patients who improved not just one, but even two classes uh, of improvement in New York Heart Association class on Mavicampton, this is really quite dramatic compared to placebo, where you don't really see much of a change 
um, at all. And again, here are the same graphs. Again, the ejection fraction is superimposable, right? You you're, t tune, you're, you're turning down the power a little bit in the myocardium, but you're also reducing afterload. So ejection fraction doesn't really change very, very much. Look at the change in Kansas City uh, cardiomyopathy questionnaire. Now, just so you know here, uh, just to give you an example, um, this change here, I think, is somewhere in the vicinity of, on, an, on an average of nine points. My recollection is that with an agent like Entresto, the change was about one point. Um, and Entresto has very, very good data, but it doesn't necessarily make you feel that better that quickly. Um, this uh, is really quite powerful. And again, LVOT gradient, Valsalva LVOT gradient. And when um, patients were crossed over, uh, after 16 weeks, the placebo group got open label Mavicamptin. You can imagine exactly what happened. Happened The patients who got Mavicamptin after 16 weeks started looking just like the patients who got Mavicamptin originally. And again, original Mavicamptin group, 91% uh, improving by uh, one New York Heart Association class, 30% um, uh, more than two classes. And you can see when patients crossed over, you started getting similar results. And again, um, gradients, LVOT gradients, this is the cro ah, sorry, crossover group. These start to all look, this, look like they're identical because they are. Everybody gets better on this drug. Um, KCCQ, once they cross over, they start getting, they start approaching each other. Um, ejection fraction stays pretty much the same. Markers of myocardial wall stress um, and, and terminal uh, BNP after everybody's on the same drug at 32 weeks, whether it's BNP or troponin I, people end up around the same place. Mass index, LV mass goes down. Uh, that was shown in the MRI substudy of Explorer. And I'll show you a couple of uh, examples from my practice as well. Diastolic function. And here's some other diastolic parameters. Um, e over E of prime ratio. This is from Valor. This is from the Valor HCM trial. You can see uh, the baseline E over E prime. And then after Mavicampton, the difference E over E prime goes down uh, a lot with a statistically significant number over here. Left atrial volume goes down statistically. And the degree of mitral regurgitation, at least one at le or at least some two grades in the uh, degree of MR as adjudicated by the core lab um, in this trial. So you can see here baseline and weak uh, 16, 1 plus MR, 2 plus 3 plus 4, and then um, in the placebo, not too much different, but a, a lot more 1 plus and a lot less 2 plus and a lot less 3 plus and 4 plus, more than 4 plus goes away. So you can see here all of the ingredients that you could think about that would go into atrial fibrillation in the future, left atrial volume, degree of mitral regurgitation, diastolic function, all of these seem to be improving considerably. Okay, so Mavicampton in clinical practice. Um, this is what I think all of us in the HCM community uh, have been uh, doing, um, taking patients who are very symptomatic and making them feel better. Um, this is uh, a patient whose baseline uh, echo, and this is a LVOT gradient that is not um, uh, coerced in any way, right? This is not provoked. This is an unprovoked LVOT gradient of almost 100 millimeters of mercury. And after they started on Mavicampton, this was one of the first patients that was started. Um, the drug became available in early May of 2022. And so you can see here, this is July 22. And now this is a provoked LVOT gradient of 17. 98 unprovoked, 17 provoked. Or as I like to say it from class three to spinning glass. And this is a true story. Um, this is another patient of mine. And I show this because uh, everybody is a little different in the way this drug is metabolized. So when I started this patient on uh, Mavicampton, even after five milligrams, they still had significant gradients. Even after they I went up to 10 milligrams, they had significant gradients. But when I finally got them up to 15, and I have to admit, this was early on in my experience. So I was actually wondering, do I finally have a patient that's resistant to this drug? And the answer is, well, no, I just had to wait longer. When I got them up to 15 milligrams, even with Valsalva, the LVOT gradient stays below 20 millimeters of mercury. And this is the initial echo over here. You can see how turbulent and how angry that LVOT flow is with the corresponding high velocity 
MR jet here. And then this is after uh, treatment. This, this image here correlates with this Doppler over here. The uh, LVOT flow is no longer turbulent. It's much more laminar. And the MR is not nearly as angry because it's at a lower velocity because the obstruction has been mitigated. Now, um, one thing that I've learned about this drug is, is what you uncover when you start using it. So um, most of my patients do not have genetic HCM in their 30s. A lot of these patients who are, old, are older and have varying degrees of basal septal hypertrophy. And after years and years of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and a thickened ventricle, you can imagine that their diastolic parameters are not going to be uh, normal, right? I mean, diastolic problems are never, never normal in HCM, but as patients get older, the ventricle can get stiffer and stiffer. So this is one of the patients that I treated who, uh, before Mavacamptin, was out of, in and out of the hospital, you know, at least every other month with heart failure. And uh, this was her, what her LECO looked like in May of 2022. You can see the turbulence through the LVOT over here, there's a little aortic regurgitation as well. And you can see the MR. There's more MR there than meets the eye, obviously, but it's shattered by the mitral annual calcification. This is her LVOT gradient. And you can see here her LVOT velocity approaches six, which means her LVOT gradient is approximately 144 millimeters of mercury, 4B squared. But look at this here. This is her uh, TR velocity, right? The TR velocity here is 3.7. If you assume her right atrial pressure was somewhere, you know, at least five millimeters of mercury, then her PA pressure is over 60 millimeters of mercury, right? So this is a very, very short of breath person. And um, it didn't matter what patient, what her doctors did for her. If they gave her Lasix and you would say, give Lasix, how can you give Lasix to somebody, you know, with, with Sam? But that's what they would be doing because she'd be coming in in heart failure. And that's what most hospitalists do. They give Lasix to patients with... Um, with heart failure, even though it's probably not necessarily the best thing. But let me show you what happened here. So we treated her with Mavicantin. Um, and in doing so, this is what her LVOT, her, her uh, apical long axis looks like with color. You can see that the LVOT flow is no longer as turbulent and therefore the MR is not as angry, right? You can see that her LVOT flow here on continuous Doppler is no longer obstructed. So before the velocity was six, now it's less than two with Valsalva. So the SAM has been eliminated, but look what happens to the mitral inflow. What you see here, she still has a restrictive filling pattern. And what we did was, well, she still has diastolic heart failure, right? And so we started treating her with the, the two agents that are FDA approved for diastolic heart failure and Tresto and an SGLT2 inhibitor. Now, before you could mitigate, before you could eliminate the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, no one in their right mind would give these drugs, right? I mean, you're going to afterload reduce and you're going to volume deplete. Well, that makes SAM worse, but now you don't have to worry about it. And you can see here, her TR velocity, which was 3.7 meters per second, is now 2.5. And by the way, it's been over a year since she's been in the hospital, um, which is pretty damned amazing. So she's happy. Her son, who's an orthopedic surgeon, and uh, I'm not sure if he knows how to pronounce or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but he's happy also. Um, one other thing that I've noticed about this drug, and many of us have, is that um, you both can treat hypertension better, and sometimes you're going to bring out hypertension. Don't forget, SAM is a flow-limiting lesion, right? And so patients may have a propensity for, for hypertension, but you don't see the hypertension because of the flow limiting nature of SAM. But once you open up the floodgates, sometimes you'll bring out hypertension. Is that a problem? No, it's not. Because if you do, you can treat the hypertension with drugs that traditionally you would never want to give patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But this is one of the nice things about cardiac myosin inhibition is that you can treat both the heart and the brain without sacrificing one to the other. Now, sometimes in my practice, I've had to give vasodilators, and, and I think uh, most of us agree that if you want the best outcomes for patients with hypertension, the best classes of agents are agents like angiotensin receptor blockers and dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Um, sometimes when I give those, the LVOT gradient goes back up, but that's okay because I can increase the dose of the cardiac myosin inhibitor. So it still works and you can come up with a balance so that you can treat both conditions without sacrificing one uh, to the other. Let me show you a couple of other pictures. This is um, a patient who is now about 35 years old, 
And this was his echo in August when he initially presented. Uh, he didn't know he had HDM. Uh, he was a little on the overweight side and had poor exercise capacity. Um, but he was, you know, he was getting very, very lightheaded when he exerted himself. So he came to medical attention. This was his initial echo. His uh, septum is about three centimeters. You can see the mitral septal contact over here. Right. So he has asymmetric septal hypertrophy with systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. And here it is again in the apical four chamber view. You can see the SAM over here. And when I put color on it, you can see that there is some MR coming this way. Most, most MR goes posterolaterally, not all does, but most of it does with HCM. And you have turbulence over here. And here's this continuous Doppler. So this is rest where he has a uh, gradient of roughly 36 millimeters of mercury and Valsalva where his gradient goes over 100. So um, for no other reason, the fact that he has a septum, which is three centimeters, he got a defibrillator. You'll notice, you recall that that is one of the uh, indications uh, in the guidelines to give the patient uh, an ICD for primary prevention, any wall over three centimeters uh, thick. So he got a defibrillator and uh, he was treated with cardiac myosin inhibition. And now here's his repeat echo a year later. His septum now is maybe about 1.5 centimeters. Now there is MRI data, which I sort of showed you that this happens, but here it is in real life, not just in a journal, but in your own, my own practice. This is the same patient, really. <laughs> um, and his heart looks completely different. You can see there's the defibrillator that he never used. It hasn't gone off once, except his myocardium is not nearly as thick. And as you could predict, the uh, mitral septal contact is much, much less. The flow through the uh, LVOT is no longer as turbulent. And you can see that on continuous wave Doppler here. This is with Valsalva. He has a gradient of eight millimeters of mercury. Remember before without Valsalva, it was over 100. Now with Valsalva, it's less than eight. Um, another patient, just to, another something that's, uh, I think, thought provoking. Um, this is a fellow who's in his early 50s and for over 10 years had been pro experiencing progressive shortness of breath and uh, exercise intolerance and fatigue and attributed all of his symptoms to largely not exercising and being out of shape, which in America, 99% of the time, you're right, that's the answer. But he presented to one of our sister institutions with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which got him admitted and got him an echo. And these are images from his initial uh, resting echo in September of last year. His Valsalva LVOT gradient here is 54 millimeters of mercury. His left atrial size in the apical four chamber view was measured as at almost 114 uh, cc's, which would be considered a severe left atrial uh, dilatation. Now, you could easily argue before the era of cardiac myosin inhibition that HCM plus AFib should equal an ablation. After all, none of the drugs that we give for AFib are particularly well tolerated. All of them have side effects. Um, you would not want to put a young person on amio, which is probably the best tolerated of them because of its, its toxicity. Um, so you might as well just ablate them. But you know, when you give an agent a drug, it doesn't mean that ablation is off the table. And when I approached one of our electrophysiologists about this patient, um, you know, he said to me, you've got him on myosin, a cardiac myosin inhibitor. Why don't we see what happens? Uh, and if we need to ablate him, we still can. Now it's a year later, this is a year later, he still, he has not had any recurrence of AFib, but his left atrium, which was 114, is now 70 cc's. And this is his Valsalva, his provoked gradient, again, less than 10 millimeters of mercury. So it's very, very um, thought provoking, I think, because the downstream effects on, on the remodeling of the left side of the heart uh, have, I think, uh, gains that are yet to be fully realized because we're still in the most incipient stages of using these drugs. But it's very possible that by changing all of the ingredients that go into AFib, diastolic dysfunction, elevated filling pressures, mitral regurgitation, um, big left atria. By changing all of these things, maybe we will prevent the need in the future for anticoagulations and TEs and cardioversions um, and uh, radiofrequency ablation in a lot of these patients. So just something to think about the downstream effects of these drugs because we're actually changing what the heart looks like.
Now, this is one other thing I just want to leave you with before we open it up to questions, because this is completely um, off label, but it's something I think that's worth thinking about. So one of my patients has NASH, non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis. He's been, you know, he's had ascites and it's needed to be tapped now and then. And he anticipates, or at least he's been told that in about five years, he may need a liver transplant. Okay. Um, he has another reason to be short of breath with exertion. I apologize for the image quality here, but you can see that uh, an, he has an unprovoked LVOT gradient of 130 millimeters of mercury. But despite that, he also has a very calcified aortic valve that looks like it has restricted opening. It's very hard to measure. You can't measure the LV aortic valve area by continuity, uh, the traditional way that we measure it on echo when you have concomitant subvalvular obstruction. But you can see the aortic valve here is rather calcified. Um, and this was his gradient. Now, obviously, no one's going to uh, operate on him. He would be a very high operative risk. So he's been treated. Now, this was February 2022. He's currently just got bumped from 10 to 15 milligrams of uh, Mavicampton. In October, actually, it just bumped him. So recently, he was taking 10 milligrams. And you can see here, there's a slightly better image quality. Here's the aortic valve. Again, it's calcified. There's still some mitral cal mitral contract contact. And you can see what the aortic valve looks like here again in the short axis. But you'll notice here that his EF let me get this back. His EF has not been tanked at all. So the fact that he has aortic stenosis, his, his LV is still very, very robust because again, you had serial resistors and we're getting rid of the first resistor by decreasing inotropy a little bit. And his gradient here uh, has gone down from over a hundred. I think the first one was, what was it? Five point something. So yeah, his resting gradient was 130. Now he has a provocable um, gradient of um, 52. So yeah, 52, I think, yeah, 52, 51, 42. These, these are both the same. So he's gotten much, much better. His ejection fraction has not in any way been adversely affected, despite the fact that he has concomitant AS. So just another possibility of a way that we might have to deal with, might be able to treat patients in the future who have uh, serial afflow tract obstruction. With that, um, what do I want to summarize? Well, we've come a long way since Dr. Bornwald's uh, initial paper. And uh, patients with obstructive hypertrophic myopathy, when we do everything correctly, not just in terms of treating alpha tract obstruction, but uh, risk stratification for uh, arrhythmias, we can give patients a quality of life and life expectancy that's similar to match controls that do not have HCM at all.